Welcome to Victim to Victory, the personal injury playbook, the podcast to navigating the complex legal system after an injury. We bring you the expert insights and guidance you need to navigate the legal system with confidence, help you make informed decisions, and get the compensation you deserve. Don't let insurance companies take advantage of you. This podcast is designed to empower you with the knowledge you need to protect yourself and your loved ones. So sit back, relax, and let's start exploring the world of personal injury law together. Today I'm joined by Ken Hardinson, the president of Pilma and of counsel at Hardinson and Cochran, with years of success running his own legal practice, Ken has successfully used his experience to launch the cutting edge association, PILMA. Now Ken works with attorneys across the nation, guiding them to reach their professional ambitions. How are you today, Ken? Doing great. Thank you so much for appearing. Yeah, appreciate you having me on. Can you tell us about your background and how you got involved with personal injury law? Yeah, you know, it was uh, was kind of wild, really. I think it really started back when I was small. My mother got in a wreck, had a lawyer, and I don't think she really had did not hire the right lawyer. <laughs> uh, suffice to say, it didn't work out really good for us. But I think I was in the back of my mind. But I've always been the kind that wanted to be my own boss, just to be honest with you. And I grew up very, very poor. In fact, I was on my, between my junior and senior year, my parents moved to another city about an hour and a half away. And I was team captain of the football team. I had a full-time job working as a meat cutter in a, in a local store in town and uh, had a girlfriend there. And I just really wanted to stay there. And so uh, my parents said, okay, but you're on your own. And so I guess between my junior and senior year, they, that summer they moved. I got a little little room I rented for like $15 a week. But you got to understand this is back in 78, 79, 78. No. Shoot, no, 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 no. Yeah. No. I'm so old. 1974. <laughs> I was thinking about college. Yeah, so 74. Damn, I'm getting old. You know, I had a toy with being a CPA, a trust officer at a bank. And then I was dating this girl the one that I didn't want to leave. And uh, she babysit a lot. So when I get off of work, like on a Friday, Saturday night, I go over, she babysit for a lot of lawyers. And I would talk to them. Of course, they'd come back, they'd be drinky, you know, a little drinky. And so they talked, they were talking, you know. And I had a lot, you know, I me, mean, I'm I'm a sponge. I mean, I'm always trying to figure out. And, you know, she did some of them that were PI lawyers, some of them that were criminal. And I liked, I liked what they were doing. And I said, and they had their own business. I said, you know, and they're helping people that need to be helped, like my mom, right? And I decided this is what I want to do. So I grew up in a small town in North Carolina, about 10,000 people. Um, They had a small school about 15 miles away called Campbell University. I got a scholarship to go there. uh, Plus, I was still working, cutting meat. And uh, I was able to, to get a scholarship. And they started a law school my sophomore year. And it was going to be uh, something real different. They were going to really, because we had Duke, Wake Forest, Carolina. We had some great law schools. Don't get me wrong, right? Really great law schools in the state. But they were going to really focus on two things, trial work and uh, North Carolina law. And, you know, you got to take the North Carolina bar. I knew that's kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to have my own practice. So I just stayed there. I uh, changed my major to political science slash pre-law. I, I got in real good with the uh, head of the department. He liked me. Uh, a recommendation from him was solid. I mean, anybody he ever recommended to the law school got in. And me and two other people out of that department were able to get in. And so I went there and uh, got married my sophomore year, too. I had two kids in law school. And uh, one right before my first semester exams and one right before my last semester exams, my third year. So anyway, I got a job with this law firm that did PI. I had been working with him during the summer. He gave me a job whether I passed the bar or not because I kind of wanted that guarantee because of my family. I had two kids. 
And so, you know, I passed the bar, I worked there, and this guy was a workaholic. I mean, I worked, we worked seven days a week. We got off Sunday morning, basically was it. And I wanted, I was a big Carolina fan. I got accepted to Carolina both times, but I decided to go to Campbell because I got scholarships both times. Got a scholarship to go to law school too, very lucky. But I wanted to go to watch Carolina. I think we played Clemson when Lawrence Taylor was on that t- team, Clemson. Uh, no Carolina. And uh, he said, well, no, I can't let you off Saturday. And I just got to thinking about it. I said, well, life's too short. I've only been working there about three months. I just walked back in. I said, I'm, I'm resigning. I said, uh, I'm going to the ball game. I said, I can, I can walk out now or I can work till you get somebody in to replace me. Because he had a driving PI practice. And I liked that. I liked that long. So he, uh, I stayed there. And I, I moved back to my hometown, the one that, uh, not the one that my parents lived in, but the one that I grew up in, where I went to high school at, and hung out my own shingle. And about a year later, law firm right across the street uh, had been there since 1929 or something. There's like three generations of lawyers in their families all went to Wake Forest. And uh, they kept associating me on cases. The father, it was basically a father and a son. The father was getting in his 80s and he just didn't want to go to court anymore. Uh, I was full of piss and vinegar. I was ready to go to court every day. You know, didn't know any better. And uh, they, they, after about a year of doing that, they said, well, we want to we want to offer you a, a partnership. Not an associate, but a partnership. And that just floored me. And uh, I said, hell yeah, let's do it. But I was a pretty good, I generated business. I was hometown. I knew everybody. And I, and I did a lot of networking and uh didn't have a lot of money to do marketing, though, to be honest with you. I just did a lot of networking. Uh, all my family was in there, friends. And uh, and I got hooked up with a bunch of lawyers in town, the older ones, and I just go to their office and I say, hey, listen, any case you don't want, I'll take it. You got any legal research you want to do, I'll do it. I said, I'll do anything. I said, I, I'm just trying I'm trying to feed my family. I said, I just, I'll do anything. Junk work, shit work that you don't want, I'll do it. I have no problem. And that helped, too, you know that first year before I got in with that firm. And then I was doing a little bit of everything when when I went over there. Did mostly this criminal PI, small corporations. You know, it was a small town. Most of the lawyers were just general practitioners. Uh, I didn't do domestic. I hated domestic. I got out of real estate and wheels. My partner did that. And then this is where everything really changed. Uh, I was going to court one day, criminal court, drive DWI. I was pretty good at DWIs. Um, like the last year I tried, when I, when I quit doing it, I tried 52 and I won 48. But that was back when judges would actually listen to the evidence. Uh, it's a little different for where I live now. It's pretty much uh, you're guilty until, you're presumed guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> it's, it's just, a, it, I've been to the South and Bible Belt. It's just really, it's hard. But, a uh, guy comes walking in the courtroom on crutches. And I said, Joe, I said, you know, I, I said, uh, I said, what well, happened? He said, I got hit by a semi. I said, well, you know, I do that. He said, yeah, but I, I decided to hire this lawyer off TV. I figured he must really be good if he knows, if he, you know, if he's on TV. Well, this lawyer was a great marketer, but he really wasn't a great lawyer, uh, but he was a great businessman. And uh, I went back to my, I tried the case, won it, went back to my office, and I sat down with my two partners in. I had two of them. I said, we got to change with the times. You know, I said, we were, all we had was just a little yellow page ad. I said, we've got to go. We've got to change with the times. we got to adapt. I said, they said, well, we, we, we think it's unprofessional. This was like in 95, 94, somewhere in there. Because my business had been like that going up. And then all of a sudden, about two years, it just started flattening out. And then the last year, it went down. And I said, I'm a better lawyer, doing a better job. What's going on? But it was TV. I mean, that's really was the big deal. And, and Yellow Pages, big trunks. I mean, you know, everybody doing double trunks and everything. So, you know, we had that conversation for about six months to nine months. And I finally just said, you know, guys, you know, I, I'm going to just break off. I said, I hate it. But, you know, and it, my, I'll never forget my, my older partner. He said, this is just a terrible time. I said, listen, this is like a divorce. There's no good time. I said, hey, I, don't, I like you. I love you. I said, but we got different visions, I said, and uh, 
everybody else in the town was complaining about it, but nobody's going to do anything about it. I said, I'm going to do something about it. At least I'm going to try. I can't not try. And so I left and took one of the associate lawyers because we had grown. We had like two associates, three partners in. So we had grown. So we'd been doing good in a small town. But uh, I took one staffer and I hired two more. So we had three staff. And then I went and just studied everywhere I could about marketing. Uh, from Dan Kennedy, Jay Abraham, read every book I could read, went to every seminar. And it was nothing out there for lawyers, I promise you. It was like 96, 95. And I take those principles and then I sit down and I said, you know, because I'd been practicing what from 82 to 95, I've been practicing 12, 13 years. I mean, I was making a good living, but I just, but I was working myself to death too. You know, I was working 60, 70 hours a week, but I was making good money. And I just felt like there was a better way. And I felt, I felt like we didn't do something that the TV, TV lawyers were going to take over. Uh, whether I was right or wrong, that's the way I felt. So I went out and everything, back then there was no capital. You had to just borrow it. You couldn't borrow it on a law firm because it was, uh, there was nothing that they could take to the courthouse and sell if you defaulted on the loan. So I had to take all the real estate I had accumulated in 12, 14 years, put it up, get a half a million dollar lot of credit and went on TV and it went crazy. And I mean, like crazy. I was not ready for it. Uh, we went from signing 20 cases up to 100, over 100 in like 90 days it was you can't do that now by the way it takes a year to two years to get some traction if you go on tv against the saturation now but back then i got in it before when it was young right it'd been 10 years it'd been in you know eight to 10 years but it's still it was still in its infancy and i didn't know what to do man i got really depressed and uh this woman came in and she had helped the law firm in another area, grow the firm, and they did some TV. And she was looking for a job, and I said, yeah. And thank God I did, because she was all about systems, processes, HR, and I, did, I didn't know a damn thing about it. I was, I, I was like, I just did what she told me to do. I knew how to, I, I had a pretty good job marketing, and I, I didn't mind trying cases. I won't say I was the best trial lawyer. But I wasn't scared to go try cases. I probably tried over 150 jury cases before I retired in 2010. Uh, and I don't know how many non-jury. I, I have no idea. Probably over 500. Because uh, I did social security. I did workers' comp. I did criminal. And I did, you know, just different things. But that's kind of, that's a long-winded story. But you want to know how I got into PI and how I got into the uh, deal. I mean, that's kind of it. And when we Five years later, we were at 13 lawyers and 47 staff. You know, and it, it just really exploded. And I was pouring all my profits. I take just enough out to live. I won't live in what they call down here, high on the hog. I just, I mean, I, I got everything I needed for sure, but I won't buy big, big fancy cars or big boats or airplanes or nothing like that. I put it all back in it. And that's, I had a lot to do with it. I, I, I was just trying to really build it up. And so like I was the second biggest spender in Raleigh TV market which was back then like the 26th largest TV market in the United States. I didn't start out that way, but by the time, you know, after five years I was, uh, just kept going up and going up. But, uh, that's the deal. So what inspired you to create Pilma? Yeah, so I sold out in 2010. I said, you know, I built this thing up. I was 52. I said, I want to go down, but I didn't want to go far because I wanted to be near my mother still lived in my hometown. I wanted, so I went, I moved down to Myrtle Beach. I like to play golf. I love to fish. I like warm weather. <laughs> sure. And so I moved down here. And so I still live here. And, you know, I played a bunch of golf and everything, and I kind of was getting bored. And lawyers were calling me and want, want to come down and pick my brain. How'd you do this, Ken? How'd you, how'd you grow so fast? How are you getting ready to retire at 52, man? You know, what's the deal? And uh, be honest with you, my wife said, Ken, I mean, it was like every week. She says, you need to start, you need to do something and, and start charging for this. Because I said, well, I don't know. And I said, you know. So I started out Pilma, uh, First Ranger Lawyers Marketing Management Association, kind of as a hobby, to be honest with you. Charged a little bit, did some consulting charge. But uh, I wanted, I like help. I like, that's one reason I like PI law. I really like helping people. I get, I get a charge out of that. And I like helping lawyers because I think if I can help them, 
especially the good lawyers, you know, because uh, if the good lawyers don't market, then all that's left is crummy lawyers out there marketing for the people that really need them, right? But they don't know the difference. I mean, maybe a little bit more now with reviews, but they can be really good business people and not really be good lawyers. I mean, I've seen some great law firms fold up because they they would not adapt for us. They thought it was unprofessional, da, da, da. And I understand that concept. I, I think it is a profession, but I think it also, you got to run it like a business. I mean, when it comes to watching, you know, your numbers and things, but I still think the client comes first. Uh, never oh, sell out. Oh, I never sell out the client. That was my big deal. I was so entrenched about that that I had a client service manual that people had to read and signed it. They read it and then they had to take a test before they could work with my law firm. We had deals where you had to call them every third. The lawyers had to call them every 45 days. Staff member had to call them every 30 days. And they didn't get their bonuses unless they met 90%. I had quarterly bonuses if they met certain financial goals. But if they did, even if they met their financial goals, if they didn't do the client service, then no. And I got, we were really into class because I know the best cases came from referrals, even though I was doing TV, yellow pages, billboard. I still looked at everything. And the best cases I got came from referrals from other clients for the most part with me. Didn't get a lot of referrals from other lawyers because they were jealous. They didn't like me. I, I mean, really, I got my whole career. I never got a bar complaint from another, from a client. I got four or five from lawyers. Uh, you know, and of course I won them every one because other than one time I did direct mail to and, and my printer screwed up by eight of an inch on something because the cost of your, this is an advertisement had to be as big or bigger than your logo. And some lawyer got it and measured it and then it was like an eighth of an inch off. So I had to throw away about $10,000 worth of the stationery. I mean, of <laughs> that's, that's and, I, and, I, and what can I say? I mean, I measured it and he was right. I, I told the bar, I said, hey, you're right. I, and listen, no excuses. I know, I, I, you know the buck stops here, but let me explain what, what happened. And it was a printer and I didn't do what I was supposed to do or my staff didn't. And I take, you know, I take responsibility. I mean, what else are you going to do? I mean, you know, but other than that, I have forgot about that. But the rest of them were just junk, you know, because we had a thing. We uh, had a client bill of rights. We had a client advocate hotline. We really pushed it like our tagline was uh, always putting you first. And uh, we got that by interviewing like a hundred of our past clients that had referred us cases. And we asked them what made us different than other law firms, because you want to figure out what you got to stand out, right? Sure. And they said, you always, it's not about the money with you as far as for your fee. It was always putting us first. You always put us first, our case first, before you did your, your firm. And they knew that because I, you know, I ingrained it in all my staff, my lawyers. I said, I said, we'll never take more than the client. No matter what, you know, their day in court, we'll give it to them. And I think that got us, we were spending, when I sold out, we were spending like $2 million a year, which was 14 years ago. But 42% of our cases came from old clients. That 42% is not a big deal if you're not spending a lot of money on marketing. But when you're spending that much money on marketing, it's a big deal. Sure. Yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, we were getting probably, we were probably signing up 200 cases a month and probably 80 of them came from old clients. That's I, great. You know, so I'm a big advocate of uh, Jay Abraham. I learned, I didn't learn it from him, but I when I, he mentored me some, and he had this doctor to preeminence. Well, everything you do should be for the betterment of your client or your customer. He said customer. I said, my client, for me, right? And so that was one of my core values. You know, we, we go by the doctor preeminence. Everything we do should be for the betterment of the client. You know, uh, the golden rule, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. Sure. You know, put them first. And I think it was just ingrained in our culture and our value, and my values. And people that didn't have it didn't stay there long. To be honest with you, uh, oh. you know, we never, we never claimed that we could get you the most money or anything. We just claimed that we would treat you right, and, uh, and you'd be first, and we'd look after you, and we'd ask you calls, and you know, because that's always been important. Number one problem: lawyers don't call clients back, and they don't keep them updated on what's going on. We we did that. So along those lines, Ken, how 
What should an injured person look for when trying to find a law firm? Well, I think you want to look at somebody that's that's proven that they've got a they've got a track record of, of winning. But also, and you can do that by looking at the reviews. And you can look at that by, you know, not just looking at them, but reading them. But also, I think you need to talk to them and see if it's a good fit. You know, it can be the greatest law in the world, but if you just don't feel right with the way they talk, then I don't think you probably, you know, I want it to be a good fit. It's like I tell people when they join our masterminds, I give them the money back. I said, you come to the first meeting, if you don't think it's a good fit, I give you money. Why would I want your money if it's not a good fit? You know, that's not, that's not smart. Then I'm going to get bad reviews, you know? So yeah, I mean, this, it just makes sense. It's the fair thing to do and it makes business sense. So it's same thing, hiring a personal injury lawyer, but you know, and I talk all about the marketing, but don't hire a lawyer just because they market. That's just getting you to where you know, but I like to ask this question because I think this is what on everybody's mind, uh, ever not every person, but 90% of people that need a lawyer or think they need a lawyer is, do I need a lawyer? And if I do need a lawyer, why should I choose you over all these other lawyers out there advertising that I see on the billboards and on TV and social media and whatever? And, and if you don't have that answer, you, you, you got a problem. You know, I think, but like I said, I never promised I'd get them the most. I mean, I tried to get them the most, but that won't what differentiate because everybody always said we're tough we're aggressive we care we'll get you the maximum recovery and uh, my past clients told me what i did what my differentiator was or whatever you know it just depends people when they're picking a lawyer i think it would be like me and you going to pick a brain surgeon it's an important deal right for them it's their life we do it every day and so it's not that big a deal to us it's part of what we do it's like a you know but if we're going to pick a brain surgeon, uh, we're going to do due diligence. We're going to ask them. We're going to talk to them and make sure that this is a good fit, make sure they know what they're doing, look at their reviews, check with the medical board. I mean, you know, those things. Uh, I think people should do that. I mean, I think they should check and make sure, you know, that they, they got any violations, of, you know, or been censored for stuff that was, had to do with clients, you know, like I said, I, I got, I had a thing on some marketing one time, but you know, I don't think that had anything to do with my character as far as my ability to practice law or, or my ability to care about my clients. That was just a clerical error, yeah, which I took responsibility for. I don't even know if they even published it, to be honest with you. I think the big deal was, you know, I didn't really dally around, which some people stick their head in the sand, try to, uh, that's when you get in big trouble as a lawyer. Yes. Uh, you know, you can't ignore it. It's, it's not going to go away, I promise you. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think people should, I think that's the big deal, though. I think it's got to be a good fit, but I think they got to really go through, check their reviews, talk to them, you know, uh, have a good feeling about it. I don't know about you, but I've, I've been, to, when I've been checking out certain things, it's got a lot to do with how, I, if I feel comfortable with that person. Right. I feel if I could trust them. You know what I mean? Sure. I think they're going to deliver. I think they're just telling me whatever I want to hear so they can get my money. You know? I, I think that's right. The trust factor, uh, having the right fit. And also, you want to go to a lawyer who treats you like family or puts you first. Yeah, absolutely. And there's some of them that don't, you know, ones that just, I know there's a lot of people that ha have their cases handled that they've never talked to a lawyer the whole time, which, you know, that would never happen in my firm, but I mean, I, he's got, you know, these real mega firms that happen sometimes. I mean, it does. Uh, if you're okay with that, then I guess that's fine. Me personally, I want to, I want to talk to my lawyer. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, had to hire lawyer, I've had to hire lawyers too. And, and I just got through hiring one for my estate purposes. And uh, the girl was doing all this. I said, well, I, I don't mind giving you all the information. I said, but I really want to talk to a lawyer. I want to make sure that I feel good about it. You know, so I think that's the most important thing is contact with your clients. I would agree with you. Yeah. And now with regard to marketing, what are the biggest challenges that law firms are facing now in the market? The fact there's so many people out there marketing, so many lawyers. I mean, people get are getting inundated. Like when I was 
first started my TV, it was probably a two hundred million dollars a year spent on advertising on TV by lawyers. Now it's probably five billion. I mean, you know, it's it's crazy. Uh, there's so many uh, people don't know. I mean, that's why I think uh, Google reviews have really been really good. For, for that's why I really preach about getting new reviews because people, you know, special people don't know. And, you know. But I think that, I think the fact that technology, you know, with the social media stuff going on now, uh, you know, they didn't teach us this in law school. They didn't teach us nothing about running a business, nothing about marketing. And really, I mean, I don't know if we'd have time for it anyway, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't know about you, but I was pretty darn busy in law school. So we had, we had a, we had short trial, long trial. We had do, we had to do an appellate brief and, and argue before the actual court of appeals and, I mean, they worked this pretty hard. I mean, they, the law school I went to, you had very few electives. Mm -hmm. They had it planned out for you. Uh, but what's good because it prepared me for the bar. And that, that, I thought that was a good, I needed that. You know, some lawyers are smarter than I was uh, or, or students, but uh, I needed that. I need that discipline. Yeah. But I think that, I think it's just so, in, you know, especially PI law, uh, not as much with criminal and domestic you know, in some of the other areas. But it, for personal injury and perhaps mass torts, it's just unbelievable the amount of hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars being spent. It's like car dealerships. They spend loads of money. Insurance companies, car dealerships, and lawyers are the top three spenders on, on the TV medium. And if you watch TV, for, which, you know, I don't watch as much of as I used to, uh, but uh, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of ads. When I go out of town, I'm staying in a hotel. I'm, I'm looking at TV at night. That's what I see. Uh, t, uh, you know, insurance, car dealers, and lawyers. So, uh, what brings value to a law firm? Okay, value. I think there's several things. Let me just be sure I understand. When you say value, I mean I know there's a, another definition of value, but are you talking like core values or value to the client or value? To the firm, or well, I, mean, I think I think the most important thing is value to the client. Okay, I think the biggest thing that brings value to a law firm or whatever is picking is number one having a good set of core values and hiring people based on those core values. A players that have your core values of what I said earlier, it's the preeminence, doctrine of preeminence. Everything you do should be for the betterment of the client. You know, the client comes first. And if you can get a team of people that are smart and do the work and got that as core values, got empathy, right? Got to have empathy. You know, I see that sometimes with people who are taking new callers, they're trying to just get that information. They said they have no empathy. Those people don't need to be on the phone with clients because they're, they're first impression, right? Sure. I always, always thought my receptionist was like, I paid them as much as I did my paralegals because I thought they were so important because you know, and I mean, I would call my office and if they didn't answer just right, the second call would be to my office manager say, listen, she didn't answer the way. I had a certain way I wanted my phone answered every time by everybody. If I called the office and they didn't answer that way, I got very upset. Uh, I mean, I didn't jump on my head somebody else because I want everybody to love me. So I want all, the, <laughs> all my staff to love me. So I, I let somebody else be the bad guy. But uh, and having, you know, good lawyers that are ethical, hardworking and really care. You know, everybody says they care, but do you? I think clients really don't care about you until they know how much you care about them. I think your employees really don't care about you until they know how much you care about them. I really do. And it's not just talk. You got to you gotta live it. You don't walk it. I mean, I've been watching like TV, MSBNC and, and or MS, whatever it is, NBC station on news. And uh, I said, don't listen to what they say to politicians. Look at what they do. <laughs> and that Absolutely. stuck with me. And I said, that's, that's just like in a law firm. You can say all you want to, but really it's what you do that counts. You know, it's, it's the walk you walk, not the talk you talk. I really believe that. That's why I had a, uh, a client advocate hotline. I had a client bill of rights. They had an 800 line they could call anytime they had any problem with anybody in my law firm. And I had somebody take care of it. If they couldn't take care of it. I took care of it. So, I mean, we had to 
30 day client satisfaction guarantee. The first 30 days, if they weren't happy the way we treated them in their case, they could, could get their file, no fees, no costs. And that was, a, I mean, it was first 30 days because I didn't want somebody to take advantage of me, my goodness, and wait right before we got ready to settle a case and then say, they called the insurance company and tried to settle behind my back. <laughs> I've had that happen before anyway, but uh, I didn't want to give them a reason to, you know. So I figured 30 days gets them a good chance to see if it's a good fit for them and me, right? Do you have any success stories? I know you haven't practiced in a while, but is there any particular story or client that resonates with you that you felt really good about doing something to help them? Yeah, you know, I did workers' comp law too. And it was this uh, Hispanic gentleman. I don't remember his name now. It's been years and years ago. He had a tragic accident, that fell off scaffold and was paraplegic from the waist down. And uh, his shirt kept was really like the first year he didn't even have a lawyer. They were really jerking him around. He hired us, and I was able to uh, get him a, a new house that was upfitted, you know, for the wheelchairs and all that stuff, a shower, all, everything in the house, get it wheelchair, you know, made. And they had to pay for that. I got him a van that was wheelchair. They had to pay for that. I got it where his wife, who was working at McDonald's, uh, instead of a nurse there, she came and worked, and they paid her you know, what she was making at McDonald's, you know, so that he, he, she could be there. And then I still had a part-time nurse. So I did all these things for him and got him the right medical treatment. You know, um, those are very tragic cases, uh, by the way. Yes. And uh, workers' comp, you know, they don't pay for pain and suffering. So you're trying to take care of their needs, right? And their future medicals and things like that. So, you know, and so we were in the, uh, this case went on five or six years, and I finally got it settled right before I sold the law firm uh, for what he wanted. He was pretty he was pretty hard on us, and I don't blame him. I was, too. So we got it settled, and he was able to move back to Mexico. He told me, he said, I'll be able to live like a king down there. He said, I can have a nice house, a maid, a driver. He said, this will take care of me the rest of my life. That and my family and my daughter, you know, my wife won't have to work anymore. So, you know, I felt like the money at the end was good, but I felt like all the stuff I did up front, like getting this house fitted up and everything, getting them a van, get this wife to be there to look after them, you know, without her, you know, having to lose the money she was making. Uh, you know, plus he got him, they had his weekly check wrong. So I got that pumped up, you know, all the things like that. So I felt like that was the thing where I really made a difference in somebody's life. Sure. Uh, you know, that made me feel good. I hated it. it took so long to get the big money at the end, but you know, you have to, you have to have perseverance, right? I mean, you know, sometimes, yes. especially workers' comp, they got to know because the, the, the future medicals were the thing on that one. But see, he got out of Mexico, he gets medicals cheap. So he was going to be fine, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that made me feel good. That's good. Other than, treating clients like family or putting them first. What other advice do you have for anybody that wants to be involved in personal injury law? Well, like, want well, to be a lawyer? Correct, yes. I think you need to do it for the right reasons. And uh, if you do it for the right reason and you treat people right, you'll make all the money you ever want to make. Some lawyers go in it, they just want to go to PI because they want to make money. I might have been a little bit of me to be my first year or two, I'm not gonna lie, okay? But it soon, it soon became evident to me that if you do the right thing and you got the empathy and you're trying to help people, the money will come. It just will. I mean, it's just the way it works. And every business I've been in, I've tried to do it that way, and it seems to work out for me uh, at least 90% of the time. So you won't, you know, I would tell you, get it for the right reason to help people. It's a very good way to make a great living, uh, even more than just to live a, a, a really good lifestyle. But don't forget, you know, I tell people, I just wrote an article for the magazine at Filma, don't fall in love with your law firm, fall in love with your clients. I've seen some lawyers, their heads get too big and they forgot where they come from. And that's, that's not a good thing. You need to go, you need to fall in love with your clients because they're, the they're the ones that really are paying your salary. Uh, it ain't because of you, you know, it's because of them. Uh, I tell, I always tell all my staff that too, you know, 
Yeah, but for the grace of God, go us, right? That's true. Uh, another thing is, too, I would never let my staff talk bad about a client. I don't care how bad they were. I said, you know, you got a problem with them, come to us, the management, and we'll take care of it. We'll get it straight. We'll fire them if they won't start treating you right. You know, if they cuss, I, if people cuss at our staff, I'd fire them. Make them a part. I'd give more. I said, you apologize. I'll give you another chance. If not, come get your file. I said, we're professions. I don't cuss at them. They don't cuss at me. They don't cuss at you. You're not going to cuss at them. And the staff really, they, they felt like we had their back. And they, you know, that created some pretty good loyalty too because they knew that we really cared about them and that, that we knew that they were human beings and not just another robot, you know, just trying to get, run the machine or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's, it's like I said, they knew I cared, so they cared about the firm and me and the clients, staff did. But, yeah, I think that's the big deal. If you're going to do it, do it for the right reason. The money will come, I promise you. Uh, you know, if you just treat people right, do the right thing. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate your time today. It was my pleasure. And thank you for all that great information. You have a great day. All right. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to Victim to Victory, the personal injury playbook. We hope you found today's discussion insightful and helpful as you navigate the complex legal system. If you or someone you know suffered from a personal injury, don't hesitate to reach out to us at 1-800-489-0004. Our team is here to help take you from victim to victory. Remember, taking legal action after a personal injury is a critical step in protecting your rights and securing your future. So don't wait. Make the call today and let us help you fight for the compensation you deserve. We'll be back next week with more expert insights and information. This podcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. The content of this podcast is based on the laws and regulations of the United States and may not be applicable in other jurisdictions. Additionally, any information shared on this podcast is not protected by attorney-client privilege or any other type of confidentiality. Remember, this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice.